and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled you could join us. If you liked our opening music, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band, and you can download it on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new, Alzheimer Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bites. We like to have real conversations with real people. So today we're going to be talking about air travel and all the exciting things that are happening. But before I introduce you to our guests, I'm going to do a couple of shout outs. One is if you haven't gone to alzheimerspeaks.com, that's kind of our mothership, please go there. We have one whole section just filled with a ton of free resources that you can participate in or download or use for training, whatever. There's quite a mixture there. And also check out our book tab. We just launched uh, Betty the Bald Chicken, Lessons in How to Care, which is a children's book, but I think the kids are going to teach us lots of lessons. Also, um, when you go to that free free educational resources page, you will also find a button to Dementia Map, which is a global resource directory that houses 150 different categories. It has an events calendar. Uh, there's wonderful articles. There's there's terminology that you don't know because you, you know you, you never needed to know it before. Uh, so you can go to dementiamap.com or find that through our free resources. We're going to hear from the Adaptive Equipment and Caregiving Corner, and then we'll be right back with our guests. I love the footbar walker, and let me tell you why. It is the option for my toolbox that I've been waiting for. Let's be honest. There are some clients who, despite our best rehab efforts, just aren't able to return to performing a sit-to-stand transfer on their own. Now I can offer my caregivers an easier, safer option that doesn't involve hoisting their loved one up from a sitting position. I don't recommend this walker for all of my clients, but I do recommend this walker for those caregivers looking for an easier, safer option with transfers. I would also encourage other therapists to add this walker to their toolbox. It's kind of like having my own mobile parallel bars for the client to pull up on. Whether it's a family caregiver at home helping a loved one with Parkinson's or dementia, CNAs in a long-term care facility assisting their patients, or therapists adapting to client and caregiver specific needs, we now have a very safe and effective option to offer in the Footbar Walker. Check this product out at thefootbarwalker.com. That's it for today from Adaptive Equipment and Caregiving Corner. Have a great day and don't forget, if you can't do it, adapt it. Well, ladies, I am so excited to have this conversation about airport travel and all the amazing things that are happening, not just here in the States, but really around the world. And so today, I hope to get from you kind of how this all started, where we're at, um, resources and tools and, and so much more. But first, I always ask every one of our guests if they've been personally touched by dementia in their own family or circle of friends. And Deborah, I'm going to go to you first. Yes, thank you, Lori. I have been touched by dementia. My mom had dementia. And she's actually the beginning of this um, advocacy journey for me. Going through dementia with her, I really decided I was going to stay connected with her the whole journey and to look at what was good about this. And that inspired my book, Love in the Land of Dementia, which I got to read part of to my mom um, while she was living with dementia and got her blessing. So that was really nice. And since then, I've been involved in one way or the other, sharing stories. I wrote another book called Connecting in the Land of Dementia, Creative Activities to Explore Together. So it has become um, a, a passion and an advocacy for me. 
Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that, Deborah. Yes. And Sarah, how about you? Have you been personally touched with family or friends with dementia? No, we have been very fortunate. And not yet. Okay, well, lucky you, not, not too many of my guests say that. So um, I want to ask you, Sarah, first, um, how did you get into this space then? Because most people get in because it knocked on their door. Um, how did it come to you? I was come to it. <laughs> well, I, I was a, a volunteer member of the Rams County Adult Services Committee. Uh, this was many years ago. And uh, Chris Rosenthal handed me a notice about the Act on Alzheimer's uh, St. Paul Neighborhood Group, which was just starting. And I was very interested because Roseville, which is where I live, has an enormous uh, senior population. And I wanted to see what this group was about. So I went to that meeting. And the upshot of the whole thing was that I eventually approached our city manager and said, I think we need to look at doing something equivalent in Roseville. And he said, go for it. And here we are. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Deborah. what inspired you? You know, your advocacy was definitely because your mom, but what inspired you to become an advocate for dementia friendly airports? Well, it started years ago when our Heart of America Alzheimer's Association was doing a conference and they brought in speakers on dementia friendly community. And Michelle Needens, who um, I met when my mom had um, dementia and she was our social worker throughout that whole journey. She was speaking and she created this beautiful speech about what the world would be like if a city was dementia friendly. And then she looked out on the audience and she said, what are you going to do to help make Kansas City more dementia friendly? And I was pretty sure she was pointing at me. So I really, I really started thinking about that. And what I came up with first was a movies and memories program. And it took me a while to think of a good venue, but I approached our public library. Um, we have a, the Plaza Library in Kansas City has a beautiful, accessible event space. It's an auditorium. And so we started, uh, we were embraced by the library. We started having programs there. We had a memory cafe. And in 2019, we had our first dementia-friendly conference. And right after that conference, our new airport was hadn't been built yet, but was just getting, you know, in the planning stages. And Michelle said, wouldn't it be great if we had a dementia-friendly airport? And so there was a bunch of us already together from the memory cafes, and we said, yes. And we just started making it happen. Slowly. <laughs> started, started hammering at them. I know it's a slow process in, in, in getting that uh, to go. Um, Sarah, how about you? How did you get involved with the Dementia Friendly Airport? I know you've got a whole working group there. So um, how did that come to be? Well, um, I got an email in June of 2018 from Joe Gogler, who is part of the University of Minnesota uh, School of Public Health. And he was at a meeting in Brisbane and he sent me an email that said, Hey, Sarah, uh, the airport here is dementia friendly. What's the status of MSP? If it's not, why doesn't your group make it happen? And I thought, yeah, right. Um, so at that point, I, I got in touch with the, the airport because they already had navigating MSP which is a desensitization program. Primarily at that point, it was for families with children on the autism spectrum. And I met with them and I said, would you be interested in expanding that to people who have dementia and their care partners? And they said, yes. And so I got back to Joe. He had some staff and students who were interested. We had the Roseville Alzheimer and Dementia Community Action Team members, including yourself, Lori, who were interested. And so about 10 of us went off to the airport and we participated one day in their navigating program. 
And when the program itself was over, we walked around the airport and basically said, oh, my God, they really need an environmental audit. They need staff training. They need all kinds of things beyond just a dementia desensitization training travel program. And so at that point, um, you also had introduced me to Ian Sheriff. And uh, at one of the global dementia meetings, there was some interest in uh, dementia friendly airports. And through that, I connected with more people around the world. And I started doing uh, self-education as to what the legislative status was, because legislation governing air transport is completely different in the U.S. than it is in the U.K., and they're far ahead of us, and the same thing with the EU. So very quickly, what happened was that I put together some materials, I started talking with people and we said, all right, we need a definition. What does it mean to be a dementia friendly airport? And um, how do we work on that? And how do we learn about what's necessary? And that led us to producing a survey and it goes on from there. Yeah, it, it's been um, pretty intense, the whole process, but the synchronicity in terms of people who know one another and kind of casual conversations and connections too, uh, which, which I have found throughout the whole dementia arena in and of itself. Um, Deborah, with you, you know, you had mentioned that, you know, it got brought, brought up in a, in one of your conversations and you decided to, you know, kind of hunker in on, you know, Kansas city airport. And can you tell us a, a little bit more of what their reception was and how you and Sarah hooked up as well? Yes. So we really, um, we, we had all traveled with, people who were living with dementia. We had care partners on our team who were actively traveling with people who were living with dementia there. So we had a lot of ideas. And our very first step was reaching out to the city because we didn't know who to talk to. And we reached out to uh, Jolie Justice, who was running for mayor at that time. And she was the perfect person because she'd had an aunt who had was living with dementia, who'd had a bad airline experience. And she was very empathetic. And she sent us to the correct person at the aviation department. What was interesting is that even though um, in the bylaws, our airport wants to be the, mo the most inclusive airport in the world, they had never considered people who were living with dementia. But when we met with um, Pat Klein at the aviation department and we brought it up and we had a care partner with us who could tell uh, quite a few stories, he was instantly welcoming. And so that, that was really something. He said, yes, what we want to do this. So we were included in design team meetings. Meanwhile, since we you know, Sarah just brought up what is dementia friendly. We had ideas, but we didn't know what we were doing. Um, Maria O'Reilly was the first person I talked to by Googling. She sent me to Sarah. <laughs> and then I knew you, of course, from our earlier interviews. And one of you got one of you got me in touch with a global team. And that I think is one of the joys, um, as you mentioned, Lori of working on a project like this is the kindness and encouragement and willingness to share from everyone involved. We got a lot of information from Sarah's group, from the global team on how to talk to the design people, other things we should be asking for, examples, and those were welcomed. When COVID came and we started meeting on Zoom, that was, um, we were able to invite in some other people who were living with dementia, who were traveling independently at that time. One of them had been um, a flight attendant. And they were crucial in getting people to listen. One of the conversations was about a sensory room and a quiet room. And the designers were saying, well, let's just combine those two rooms. And the, the gentleman who was living with dementia said, that won't work. 
that won't work for me. And so the, the team part of this, and I've seen it in the global group and in Sarah's work group of people genuinely wanting to help each other and wanting to make this happen was um, very inspiring. But then two years has gone by since we've been part of a team because all the planning, it's now been building. So we didn't know what was going to happen until, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Why yeah. don't I pop up the quiet room and the, um, the sensory room just so people can visually see those. And then can you tell us the, the difference and why it was important to have those two separated, Deborah? Yes. So the quiet room is actually quiet. And it is, and when you walk in, it, it's a really well done room. It's got forest green walls. It's very soothing. And there's places to sit and they're almost like, you're almost cradled. It's very, very comfortable. The chairs are easy to rise up from. And so it is a place where you can just sit in absolute quiet. And the sensory room is more activity oriented. It has red lights. There's some flashing lights. There's activities to do in there. It's more of a place where people who have some restlessness need to come to cool down in the airport. So there will be a lot more movement in that room. So we're very lucky that we got a designated quiet room. And it was, I think, because of having a teammate who was very articulate and living with dementia, people instantly understood what he was talking about. Wonderful. Sarah, anything you want to add about those two rooms at all? Well, the difficulty when we talk to airports that are designing any of these new spaces or reconfiguring existing spaces, the problems that they point out are that anything that is post security is um, economically important space to the airport and there's competition for using that space and for using it for retail or something else that brings in money. And neither the sensory room or the quiet room will do that. And so it becomes a really difficult situation to get them to agree to designate space for that use that's going on right now msp is just talking about an expansion of terminal two and having a sensory room and i was in the meeting and i said but <laughs> you need to have a quiet room a quiet space also and the architect's interested in talking but i would be surprised if there's any funding for that right away um at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport, they are using the chapel as a quiet room, but it is pre-security, <laughs> which means that, A, if you've gone through security, you can't come back out and use it, but also it means that it's open to anybody and everybody who's using it for whatever their own reasons. Um, so it's available, but it's of limited use. And that's that's the contest that goes on all the time. Some of the sensory rooms have been funded by groups of parents who have children on the autism spectrum and they have funding and they have clout in whatever their communities are. And they're able to come in and say, this is what we want and we'll pay for it. Uh, we don't have that in the dementia community. And it's not just the dementia community that needs quiet room. Yeah. Well, and I've found, you know, just in my travels, sometimes when I've gone into a quiet room, they're really a prayer room. I mean, they're mm -hmm. set up specifically to meet cultural yeah. needs um, versus disability, you know, needs. And there's a big difference between those in terms of just, is it comfortable to be in the quiet room <laughs> you know, or not? Um, so, so I think that that is, to me, that's almost a whole separate room in and of itself that's needed because I think quiet is different to different people um, mm -hmm. in terms of, of how they, how they um, even sit in comfort and uh, versus maybe um, being on a pad to pray on the floor and things. Go ahead, Sarah. Well, the other thing too, is if you think about the size of any of these terminals, 
Mm -hmm. um, having one space that's designated, in this case, as a quiet space, <laughs> isn't necessarily going to accommodate the number of people who need it or the people who need it, depending on where they're located in the terminal, if they've gone out to their gates or whatever it is. So it's important, I think, to start to think about how do you de designate mini spaces? How do, mm -hmm. you, how do you get airports to um, rearrange some of their seating throughout the airport so that some of it can serve multiple pur purposes? Mm -hmm. And I haven't heard very much from airport designers with respect to that right now. Yeah, well, that's a good point, because when we went out to do the, the simulated thing at MSP, it was by an elevator, but there was a sitting area. And I'm like, oh, I never, you know, I'm in this airport all the time. I had no idea this area was here. So it didn't have to be enclosed. And when I was, I think it was out in Pennsylvania where I saw the quiet room, I couldn't find it. And finally, I had to ask and they're like, well, we try to kind of keep it hidden. So it wasn't, it was, it, there was this beautiful wall and it almost looked kind of artsy. And then you had to walk and it, and it was kind of wavy, if I remember correctly. And then you had to walk behind that to see the sign. Well, I didn't know I could go behind that wall. I mean, that's kind of how I, <laughs> I felt. So uh, you really needed to point it out. But yet, I know that they have to be real careful too, because uh, people are kind of crazy these days and you don't know what they'll do in a private room in a public spot either, <laughs> which is awful to say, but it's very true uh, with things. And so there's a, there's a protection too of, you don't want people to prey on maybe someone that they foresee as being vulnerable either. So you know, there's, there's so much to consider on that. I'd like to talk a little bit more um, about a couple other things while we're on it. And I'm going to put up a couple of um, pictures on bathrooms because I thought this was real interesting with, with Kansas uh, City. So here, you know, we've got, it's the long row of bathrooms. It's, it's greatly, you know, lit nice and clean and sharp. All of those types of things looks like good contrast. But what, what I was so excited about was the adult changing table. I had never seen one of those before. And that is something I know people in my memory cafe and different support groups. And when I go to conferences, mention all the time how difficult it is, you know, to care for their loved one and being able to also have family bathrooms as well. So Deborah, was that, was that automatically there? Or was that something you had to fight for? Well, we had to campaign and our um, Elizabeth Miller, who was on our team, who was a care partner actively traveling with her beloved, who was living with dementia, was the person who really um, spoke up about that on a very personal note, saying, what are people supposed to do? Mm -hmm. And taking it beyond dementia, too. And so we were thrilled to see that changing table. And it's easy to use. And the room is very spacious with a toilet in there. Um, and so that was one of the points of great excitement when we got to tour the airport and, and saw that there. They also put in a changing room. And that pretty much has nothing in it. It's almost like you'd have at the swimming pool, but it's a private room that, you know, somebody could change clothes in with another person there. So I thought that was another nice addition. But yes, I having the care partners and the people who are living with dementia as part of the team was so vital to um, for people who haven't had the experiences to really let the story sink into them. So let me ask you, with the adult change, changing tables, because like in a, in a regular bathroom, like a baby changing table is just out there for everyone to see. Are those only in private settings in, in, a, in a larger like stool area? So that one is in when you walk into the restroom, and that, is, that restroom is an all gender restroom, that that's, you see that before you start walking down the aisles with the stalls on them. So you see the adult uh, changing room, right? Okay. There. 
So yeah. it's, it's a room, though. It's not out in the open where everyone's going to see you changing an adult's. Oh, no. It's, okay. a, it's that's, a closed room with a toilet. Yeah. Okay. That's what I wanted to make sure, you know, yes. that people under, understood that that difference there. Um, I think yeah. that's, you know, fabulous. I know, Sarah, when we were walking around um, MSP, you know, we kind of just looking at signage and stuff, I, I believe that was one of the things that we brought up is like, where's the family bathrooms, you know, and, and go ahead, you were going to say something. Well, MSP now has three rooms with adult changing tables. One is pre-security, two are post-security, and they are locked and you need to access them using their security system. There are problems with people misusing them. Yeah. And that I, I don't know if anybody has any ideas as to how to prevent that or reduce that from happening. Yeah. It's, the the other thing um, I wanted to ask if either of them, because, and this is, uh, this happens with everyone. Uh, people like the automatic, put your hands under the sink and the water comes out. But I know I have like invisible hands and nothing happens. And other people say, no, it should be handles. Uh, have you guys heard anything more? I mean, there's kind of two sides on that. Deborah, I'm going to go up to you first and um, do you know in their bathrooms, do they use the, the sensory or the knobs or a combination? In the main sinks, there's a row of sinks. It's all hands-free. Mm -hmm. They were very intentional about that. Now, I can't remember right now in the adult changing room if there are knobs or not. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yep. Well, and, and with that one, you might want the hands free even more yeah. <laughs> you know, with that. So, and with COVID, I mean, that makes more sense too, uh, you know, with all of that. So, um, and then I, I, while we're talking about this, I want to show the a flight simulator and what that is all about. I, I personally found that fascinating when we, when we did that with MSP, but I was really intrigued um, with what I heard, how Kansas City developed their simulation room. So, Deborah, do you want to talk about what went into that? Yes. That was really an exciting room. And um, Justin Meyer, who was, is the marketing deputy at the airport and an aviation lover, they found an old airplane that was about to be scrapped. And so it is actually in part of an old airplane. It's within the airport. And so it mimics walking in. There's a walkway to get into the airplane. There are 12 actual seats there. And then you look down, and it looks like, you know, the plane is stretched behind you. They have a restroom in there so people can practice opening, closing, getting in and out of that space. They have uh, the storage bin so you can practice stowing your suitcase. And then the technology was not turned on the day we were there. But when it is turned on, they it simulates taking off. So they, they show a safety video like you'd see if you were on a flight. And then you can see out the windows, it simulates the plane taxiing, making the noises it would, and getting ready for takeoff. So it's very exciting. And that is a room that needs to be by appointment. And they recommend you come, you know, before on a different day that you're going to travel. And they'll have somebody there to guide the tour. They did a very innovative job of that, and they're very excited about it. We are, too. We're inside the Kansas City Air Travel Experience, and this is a really special place where travelers who may have an aversion to flying, like dementia, uh, have the opportunity to practice air travel. So we've got a check-in kiosk here. You can take your boarding pass, scan it on this reader. I'll get you ready to board the flight. Step right onto here, which is a simulated passenger boarding bridge, just like the ones we have in Kansas City with the glass walls. So there's murals here on the side. And then stepping into, uh, this is our actual aircraft, a retired Airbus A321 aircraft that was here, about to be scrapped in Kansas City. Uh, the project procured this airplane and uh, put in a whole bunch of technology to help travelers um, become comfortable with flying. 
So there's a total of uh, 12 seats here, uh, just two rows, a visual indicator of kind of what the rest of the aircraft looks like. Uh, the opportunity to practice stowing the overhead bags in the overhead bins, practice buckling seatbelts, um, and then uh, even the lavatory behind you uh, that can be uh, utilized to kind of just have familiarity and awareness of how that process works. There is a lot of technology here. It's currently turned off, but the, uh, the screens play of uh, safety briefing and then uh, the windows will reflect movement. So the aircraft actually looks like it's taxiing, uh, pushing back, taxiing, takeoff, cruise, departure, all of that uh, as part of the project. I love that the, it features the multi-sensory, you know, what you see, what you hear, what you yeah. touch and feel, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and being able to stow the bags, because that does get tricky sometimes for people yeah. or just buckling up in a seat. Um, there's, there's so many different facets that we just take for granted that, you know, it's no big deal to do, but it is complicated and it can be scary, especially for somebody with dementia and, and that um, even some of those noises, you know, being positioned by the bathroom, being positioned by a window or an aisle seat, all of those can have triggers for somebody with dementia. And so, you know, that those are important things to consider. And sometimes you don't find those out until you actually travel and go, okay, we, we'll, we'll do it a little different next time. You know, it's kind of a trial and error with all of this. Um, also, because every person with dementia is a little bit different. And every trip, they're probably going to be in a little different mood and different, different space. But I think this um, guided support is, is absolutely wonderful. Um, Sarah, now you've been through the experience at MSP. I don't know if you have at any other airports. Um, what, were, what were some of your thoughts? Anything you wanted to add to what Deborah said? Well, M MSP installed their, Delta installed their flight room um earlier this year at, well earlier last year uh so i have not been in it but it does not have the bathroom or any of the visual simulation of flying um it's used routinely for people training service dogs uh, I know that Carol Giuliani is looking to use it for training some of her uh, travel companions. Um, but other than that, it is used, by, again, pretty heavily, I think, by the autism spectrum community to have children and other people on the spectrum come in and just practice sitting. I don't know what else they have in it. Um, they don't advertise it as having anything else particular. Okay. Um, Deborah, you mentioned that there was, uh, you know, one person with dementia, one person, uh, one care partner as well that kind of helped um, the committee uh, go through. Did you guys do like a survey or um, do any kind of town hall meetings on what people wanted um, to reach more people at all? I know everything's time consuming. Then you're in the mix of COVID on top of it. <laughs> it's complicated. We, our little group didn't do a survey. We talked to a lot of people. We had a lot of people um, on our team, not the airport team, but the dementia friendly team who contributed, who weren't part of the actual airport team because they didn't want to come to the meetings. So we did it that way. We did not have a survey. And then of course the airport people themselves had many different communities um, giving their feedback as to what they wanted in the airport. Now, Sarah, I know with the Roseville AD group, the, the survey that we all put together, and I mean, you you and I think it was Tara, uh, or no, who was Colleen. it? Colleen. Colleen. Um, worked so hard on was, it was really kind of widely received with a lot of great feedback from people with dementia and their care partners. And I thought that we got a lot of great insight from them. Is that something that is accessible for others to be able to see? No, not anymore. Um, it was done with cooperation of the University of Minnesota, and it's sequestered on their website. <laughs> um, so it's, it's not accessible to people. Um, they can send me an email if they need to, if they want to know what some of the questions were. But we had enormous participation. We had 49 people who had Alzheimer's disease or related dementias or MCI 
who completed the survey. We had 176 people who identified as travel companions or care partners who completed the survey. So to our knowledge at the time, and this was 2019, this was the most complete survey of people living with dementia who were engaged in air travel. And the information that came from it enabled us to then start developing tools and look for protocols that would be um, not only valuable to the travelers, but be a valuable to, to, of value to the, the airports who were interested in modifying or adapting anything to be more user friendly. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And then as far as your, um, your Roseville AD and the, the airport committee, do you have people on the committees now? I mean, or have you in the past that are living with dementia? Mm -hmm. Well, Roseville AD has had, um, in the past, we've had occasional people who are living with dementia who are on the committee. The Roseville, uh, the Dementia Friendly Airports Working Group has had individuals and the most active one has been John Richard Pagan. Um, but it's very difficult to get people uh, living with dementia who have the time and energy to contribute to any of the discussions or identification of what they think is important for the rest of the committee to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had some people express interest, but then they never follow through. Yep. So. And, and it's hard because a lot of times they can't get there themselves. They have to rely on somebody else. So, I mean, there's schedules and there's the ups and downs just with the symptoms itself that can affect somebody. And then I think you also need, and this is with pretty much any advocate, you need that kind of personality um, that can communicate in a, in a way that the rest of the group is going to understand and, and that can get complicated sometimes, you know, when people have, have dementia symptoms. But I know it's, it's a struggle for most groups um, to, to get a fair number of people. And if you can get one or two here or there, because their insights are, are so powerful. Uh, and I think sometimes they don't realize uh, how much they know and how much they could, how much they have to tell us with things. So let's, um, let's talk about changes, Sarah, that you've seen, because you've kind of been doing this a little bit longer than, than Deborah, in airport travel itself, um, from when you first started till today, you know, what, what are some of the big things that you've seen that have changed? Well, um, several things. One, one is um, DFOG, the Dementia Friendly Airport Working Group, put together a best practices uh, national security brief. It, it was uh, a piece of instruction for the TSA agents who do the actual security examinations. And this was done in conjunction, again, with somebody living with dementia who had a, a letter that was involved. But uh, it was read to 50,000 or so TSO officers at shift change, uh, instructing them in, in the best way to interact with people coming through security when they were there, either by themselves or with a care partner. And part of that involved uh, instructing them not to separate the person living with dementia from their care partner. So that was in 2020. And that was a big deal because we did it in conjunction with TSA. And uh, we hadn't had any cooperation that we knew of before that. Um, another thing is the uh, adoption and expansion of the airports that are using Sunflower Lanyard, which mm -hmm. is from the UK and is now about 70 airports in the US are using this. And then there's also this variation on it, which is has the white on it. And that's for people who are supporters of the Sunflower Lanyard. So if I'm accompanying somebody who has the Sunflower Lanyard on, I will wear this one if it's available. 
Um, and those airports have some very, very minimal training for their staff, which basically comes down to being kind to somebody who's wearing one of these and extending more patience to them. Uh, so that's something that's gone on. I participate, and I have since 2018, in the Travelers with Disabilities Advisory Committee for our local airport, which is MSP. I also participate in the national TSA uh, Disabilities and Multicultural Advisory Committee, um, which meets when it meets. Um, but I've then been pulled into other committees and through TSA, I've been participating in another disabilities advisory committee, which met last October. And to my delight and surprise, there were actually TSA people there talking about the lanyards. Now, we may never get TSA to adopt it, and it has to do with their view of not, not being uh, proponents of a specific commercial enterprise, even though the lanyards are not commercial. But if they at least acknowledge it so that all of their examining officers had some little pin or something indicating that they recognized this and they had given some been given some basic training then people coming through would be able to assume that they would be recognized as needing more assistance so that's kind of under development we've come up with new tools um, one of the tools we've had on, on our website forever, and that's for people who are traveling, and that's resources for travel. And it has an extensive list of how to prepare for the travel and how to go through security and how to what tools or other things you might want. So that's available to people who are travelers. But we now have this brand new tool which are nine videos that we wrote the scenarios for and they were put together by Tipa Snow. And they've just been released and they are available on our website for anybody to use as long as they credit where they come from. And they can be used for training airport staff, retail staff, training people who are care partners who are going through going to go through the airport just to show what might you expect and how to advocate more clearly for whomever you are traveling with. So those are now available and we're trying to get the word out to anybody and everybody to make use of those and we hope that that happens. Another thing that we did, uh, Jan Doherty and myself, uh, and Jan is the author of Travel Well with Dementia. Mm -hmm. um, that's been out for a few years. It has excellent suggestions, and she's part of Defog, too. We put together a sector guide for dementia-friendly America, and that's been published and on their website since September of 2022. Uh, so it has, again, links and information for people traveling. And then the other thing that we have, uh, Jan put together, she took the Alzheimer's Association uh, 10 signs, and she put together a list of how those 10 signs manifest themselves at the airport. And we've been sharing that with anybody and everybody we can, because it's really important to understand what you're looking at, depending on the behavior and such. So we have those as tools that are out there right now, in addition to other tools that are on the Defog website. What I'd really like to do is share the website with people. So here we're at the home of the Dementia Friendly Airports group. Now you said um, training resources is what you had mentioned. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. So first off, it looks like these are the, the Tipa Snow it videos, is. and we'll get yes. to those in just a second. Um, and here's the acknowledgement that needs to be used, um, contact information. And then down here are the different videos. 
you know, and I, I watch these, these are done so well. They're very realistic. There's a couple others I would have loved to have seen on there, but you know, there's talk about getting separated when you travel, which is huge. I can't tell you how many stories I hear of that one and how training of the airport staff will really help, but also for the families to realize this could even happen so quickly. I mean, it's nanosecond and you're separated, especially in, in busy airports. Um, there was one about requesting a wheelchair yes. and, and how that can work. And a lot of people don't even know that they can request that um, from their airport. Were you going to say something, Sarah? Oh, it, 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 um, no, it's okay. It's, but the wheelchair, you have to request it from your airline. And the problem is that the, um, the concession that runs the wheelchairs are separate. They are hired by different airlines and getting training to those people is even further down the line. It, mm -hmm. It's more difficult, but it is people having problems when they are in the airport wheelchairs is quite a common complaint that we hear. Yeah. So. Um, I thought, you know, finding your gate and uh, was was really interesting too. And um, this altered time one where you, you'll like just stay here for just a minute and they think it's a half an hour and the anxiety and different ways to approach. So what I love about how they did all of these videos was there's kind of the average Joe way of this is how it's handled. And then there's like, boy, with a little bit of training, not a whole lot, but with a little bit of training, you can make this experience different for not only the person with dementia, but their care partner and yourself as a staff member or just uh, someone trying to assist. Um, the, the kiosk checkout, I, I made me chuckle because sometimes I still struggle with that too <laughs> in terms of if it's not, you know, picking up my hand, uh, you know, for the, uh, you know, when you're hitting stuff on what you want to do and things there. Um, getting to the airport ticket counter, um, hallucinations. I thought that was a brilliant one to do because that often happens where they're seeing or hearing something that the rest of us aren't. And how do you, how do you handle that situation without um, escalating it? And then the retail store making a purchase, I'm not sure what to get, um, money management, those types of things. And, and in this one, if I remember correctly, uh, the person behind them decided just to help them out and pay for it. And it you know, sometimes it's a little simple act of kindness that we can make someone's life a little bit easier. Um, checking their bag was very interesting when you get to the gate, but no, I kept my bag because I want it with me and now you're taking it away. And how you can de-escalate that anxiety. And then the last one was really talking about how things kind of got started with the airport and, and what they were doing there. These are all just absolutely um, well, well, well done. Something I hope people, you know, will be able to share. The scenarios were put together by Defog. Um, the execution of these was done pro bono by TIPA. Mm -hmm. So, and it had to be done within a limited number of hours and Charlotte Douglas Airport was willing to partner and host us and that last interview is with the ada civil rights specialist at charlotte douglas airport okay um, and th there was just a limit to how many scenarios could be done what mm -hmm. we've been advocating for again is for tsa to hire tifa mm -hmm. <laughs> to produce some more vi videos that would be partly specific to them and then could also include something like what happens if you're separated from your partner or whatever. But I have no idea if that's ever going to happen. Which so. would be an ideal one to do that transition because not only could it be used for general public awareness and preparing, but it could be used for training over and over and over again with their staff. And all of these videos, I mean, they're like under five minutes. So um, but very, like I said, very, very well done. Um, now, you also mentioned um, resources for travel. So I'm going to go down here to know your rights. 
Um, I thought that was interesting in terms of, of what is here, you know, traveling with a disability, what does that really mean? And if I'm not mistaken with the sun, uh, sunflower lanyards, they don't have to disclose what their disability is, um, right. even to get preloaded on a flight, you know, be one of the first to get on. Um, my understanding, and again, correct me if this is wrong, but somebody can just say I have a disability and I'd like to um, get seated early. Yeah. Whether or not that ahead. happens is, of course, <laughs> up to whoever the gate person is. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, interesting. And then, you know, complaints and things like that. I think, you know, that, that's important information for people to know. Um, here's one on process to start from start to finish. So booking your flights, um, and there were, um, I, I remember just from being in on some of the meetings and I, I wish I could, I, I could attend more and I just can't, but, um, like uh, there was a lot of little ticks and tick tips and tricks in terms of booking. And this is very much, I think, worth your while to, to look at, you know, having the medical alerts for the safe return, um, talking about passports, all of that stuff is in here. We've got preparing for your flight, um, arriving at the airport, getting through security, navigating to your gate, um, flying in and of itself, and, uh, you know, arriving at your destination. And not everybody does that all the time together. Sometimes a person's put on a plane and someone else is, is picking them up, you know, at another, another spot. Um, I'm going to go to tools for travel. Um, do you want to highlight what's on here, Sarah? Well, there are tracking devices that have a lot of these are, uh, well, they keep coming up with new ones. So smartphone watches and, and this kind of thing. So we haven't, made an effort to identify the latest of whatever is available. It's just an idea to show people that you might want to find something like this. And I know that uh, the U of M is doing a study right now on the efficiency of some of these tracking devices. Part of the problem becomes whether or not they, their technology works inside an airport terminal mm -hmm. because some technology is dampened in order to prevent it from interfering with whatever else needs to go on in the terminal. But the idea of having some way to communicate with your travel companion, if something happens, is really important. Yeah. Uh, knowing about travel companion services, and there are three that we've listed there. One of them is senior travel companion services. This is a local gal uh, Carol Giuliani, who has been doing, she's done over 100 trips, a lot of them, but not all, are with people who have dementia or some other serious health problem. She's not a nurse, um, but she is very skilled in navigating uh, the ins and outs of what happens when stuff doesn't go right yeah. on, on a trip. And she does other trips, not just air trips. It's well, and if I remember correctly, Carol uh, was an attorney and her yes. client base kind of was aging out and still wanted to travel and said her family didn't, their family didn't have time. And so that's kind of how she got into this, which I thought, thought was just fascinating. And she's been all over the world yep. um, from big events to small events. And um, so I think those are so, you know, so, so helpful you also have some things here on security um, and again, navigation, which we um, talked about in the last one. And then there's a, the memory minders travel kit on that. Um, and again, you can get to the sun, sunflower lanyards here as well. And the hidden disability store. There's, there's lots of cool, cool things here. I know I was part of the committee that did the memory minders um, travel kit, which is pretty extensive, but I, I know the feedback we got from people like in our, our memory cafes was it was really helpful things to have just in case of an emergency and what to pack. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, because it's been quite a while, I think there was even a list of 
what you might want to bring on the plane to make that more a more comfortable experience yep. um, for people. So there's just this site is loaded with great, great information. And I, you know, I can't, um, I can't thank you guys enough for for pulling this all together. So check out dementiafriendlyairports.com. And you, you can find out all kinds of, of things. You know, in the beginning here, if you go to the Dementia Friendly Airports details, it'll bring you to this page, what, which has all kinds of uh, different information from what is a dementia friendly airport to, um, you know, how to improve travel and requirements and so forth, information on the hidden disabilities. Um, but what I wanted to share, because I thought it was really important, that de- the dementia symptoms, how they're manifested um, okay. at the airport. So, um, so under training yes. materials, hidden disabilities yes. and dementia friendly, there is the yes. how dementia symptoms manifest, manifest at the airport. And this is a, a downloadable piece that, that people can go ahead and print off too, which is really nice. Uh, so did you want to highlight this at all? Well, it's just important to be aware of this. And if you are traveling either Mm -hmm. as a companion or as the person who is living with dementia, Mm -hmm. uh, you may want to look at the behaviors and how this might impact you and, and think about what, what do you want to do to be prepared? If, if you start feeling this way or your companion feels this way and, and what can make this better. And if you want to use this as a training tool, for people who are working in the airport, uh, it's it's a very handy and simple reference. Yep, so. exactly, exactly. Well, thank you for all this wonderful information on here. Sarah has already shared a lot of that with me, so I could share that with our airport team as they're starting their training and also starting into the sunflower program it's been invaluable to have her organizational skills in and having so many things that they can look at to get oriented here well I, i'm really glad that's helpful and and i want to point out that defog has not only worked with kansas city but we've we've worked with missoula montana which has just built a new airport terminal Mm -hmm. and they have taken a lot of these ideas straight straight out of the website and implemented them also so we're very excited to see that some of these ideas are are getting life Uh, we also interact with Tulsa airport and with uh, Charlotte Douglas and Raleigh Durham, and, and there are a number of airports who are taking bits and pieces as it's useful to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're very happy to put those pieces together. But can I say something? Because you had asked us both about impact and, and input from people living with dementia, and mm-hmm. I have an ask for them. Okay. Okay. Um, because so much of what we do is, is put together to try to help improve the situation for those of you who are living with dementia or your care travel companions as you go through the airport. What's useful to defog is to hear from you. Have you encountered any particular situation as you're traveling, which is either good or bad? If so, to describe it, when it happened, the specifics of the airport, what kind of staff you dealt with, how it was resolved, and how you might want to see it resolved in a different way. And that would be very valuable for us. And you can do it very simply by going to the DFOG website, clicking on contact us, and dropping an email into that website. And that way we can continue to work on what people in this population identify as being serious issues or resolved issues, both Mm -hmm. of which. And and I'll tell you that a lot of the airports would be thrilled to hear that somebody has had a good experience with whatever it happens to be. The, The other ask is that if you 
look at the website that leads you to the sunflower lanyards and you think that that's a good idea, if you inform the customer experience people at your local airport that you want to see this become available, that would also help very much. In the United Kingdom, these lanyards are recognized and given out and honored in almost every sector of the community. So all transportation, not just air transportation. And then sports events and arts and the health service and education and retail. So it's people can go all over the place and they have an easier time because if they're wearing one of these lanyards, people will ask them if they need more time or assistance or something instead of just saying, oh, I don't want to go near whoever it is because I don't understand that behavior. Um, we would love to see that kind of expansion in the United States, but it's very, very hard to get traction. And if people who think this is important and can live with it ask for it, maybe <laughs> eventually we'll get there. So Exactly, exactly. Uh, Deborah, anything else you would like to add? Well, just that this has been such a valuable and inspiring program, and I think listeners can just see how um, the passion for making travel is such an important life, sometimes such a necessary part of life, and how the passion and the generosity in sharing ideas, as you know, I was just saying, Sarah's hard work is coming to Kansas City, and the Sunflower Lanyards, which we first heard about in the Global Dementia Team. And here we are in Missouri living next door to Kansas. State flower is the sunflower that is made for us. So I am so excited that that program is coming to our airport. And all those little things and all the advocacy make a world of difference to people. And your show is going to make a difference, too. So thank you so much for inviting us to talk about this. Well, this is a this is a big issue, and you know one of the things that I hear from um, from families so often is they don't want to give up travel, but they don't know how to maneuver it. It's too difficult, and you know this is about this is quality of life. You know this is about the ability to still explore and have fun and and you know feel safe and supportive um, on on a trip. And so I think it's I, I you know. To me, it's just very dear to my heart. I remember traveling with my own folks and, you know, it was cumbersome to say the least. Frustrating might be a better term, you know, <laughs> and even a tad of anger at times, you know, maneuvering through the process um, as a care partner with all of this stuff. So you guys are doing a wonderful, wonderful work, you know, and wrapping up, you know, I, I really think our audience is going to be thrilled to, to hear hear how much progress has really been made. Um, even during COVID, things have still pushed through and to hear that there are actual, you know, new airports being built to accommodate and others are trying to adjust and modify uh, within their system, which is, it's, that's a little tougher task to do. Um, but the, they're open to hearing this. Um, they're open to seeing the difference that, that it can make, not just for, people traveling, but for their staff, it's going to make the experience much better as well, you know, keeping everybody happy. So you have an ask too of our community to be a giver of hope, like click and share this episode, not because Alzheimer's Speaks wants the, the, the little ticks, it's because people need the information. And there are people in your circle, um, in your family, in your friends, in your neighborhood, co-workers, um, at church that are, are dealing with this stuff and they're not telling anybody about it. And we have to make it comfortable for them to be able to reach out and feel respected and supported. And so it'll just take you seconds. Um, but I, I do think this is a life changer and a game changer for, for so many. As far as, you know, websites go, we're, we'll have all of that stuff listed. So we've got the DementiaFriendlyAirports.com that will get you to all the, the training. It'll get you to the videos. It'll get you to the resources. 
um, and um, you'll be able to contact them uh, through that site. And for uh, Deborah, um, she's at DebraShouseWrites.com. And her email is Deb and Ron, Z-O-G at gmail, uh, dot com. And then you also have a blog, uh, DementiaJourney.org. You've got a YouTube channel um, and you've you know, got your books as well. Love in the Land of Dementia, Finding Hope in the Caregiver's Journey and Connecting in the Land of Dementia, uh, Creative Activities to Explore. And again... Travel Well with Dementia by uh, Jan, Jan Doherty. Doherty. And, and that, again, is, is on the website under tools and travel tips. And okay. then, uh, you know, all of these are available, I'm sure, on Amazon as well yes. and, and Barnes and & Nobles and things. So um, thanks, everybody, for, uh, you know, sharing your stories. I, I love hearing the collaboration that's going on worldwide and, uh, you know, just... Uh, really warms my heart to see the progress that's being made. It's pretty cool stuff. So thank you Um, to our audience. um, Again, please like, click and share uh, emphasis on share (laughs) this information with others. And we will see you next, uh, next time you can always go to alzheimerspeaks.com for more information as well. And I will also give a plug for dementia map. Um, and the dementia friendly uh, airport group is on there as well. So you can you can find them there. And then also I have to give one one last plug for uh, Betty the bald chicken lessons in how to care. It is not necessarily dementia specific, it can be used for bullying, discrimination, death, illness, all kinds of things just when you don't feel like you fit in in life. And how do you care for yourself? How do you care for others? How do you want to be cared for? Uh, but it's a, it's a cute uh, illustrated book for children. And I think the kids are probably going to teach the adults a few lessons in how to care um, because they, they don't have preconceived notions with things. So anyways, again, fabulous show. Appreciate your time. Keep up the good work. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.